Joshua Tamor Nana of MTAR LLC will start first. He will speak for about 20 minutes. And I'll come back out to orchestrate a Q&A where we'll give you an opportunity to ask questions. There will be two microphones placed in the aisles, and you can come up and ask your questions, and I'll be happy to facilitate that discussion with Joshua. After that, we'll take a 10-minute break, and after those 10 minutes, we'll come back with Dr. Katie Warren Johnson, CEO and co-founder of Carbon 38, break for 10 minutes, and then come back with Dr. Lauren Downing-Peters, and then convene in the gorgeous Brand Meyer Grand Hall for some networking and visiting. And there are booths out there that we hope that you will visit, including one of the most prominent Midwestern college-level fashion programs from Kansas State and Manhattan, Kansas, the Kansas City Art Institute in Midtown Kansas City, and Stevens College in Columbia. Without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce Joshua Tamora Nana. Joshua Tamora Nana is co-founder and CEO of MTAR LLC. He is a Kansas City native who started his apparel manufacturing career for an apparel manufacturing company in Dubai. Over 17 years ago, he started producing for many American and European brands from his offices right here in Kansas City and production facilities in Asia. Working with hundreds of designers and setting up countless global supply chains, he has grown to be a leader in speed to market manufacturing and strategic global supply chain management. He is passionate about the future of supply chains, just-in-time manufacturing, and closed-loop manufacturing, as well as digital innovations that will continue to transform the industry as we know it. Let's welcome Joshua Tamora to the stage. Please, a nice warm round of applause. Thank you for having me here. That was a great introduction. Really, I'm a supply chain geek. So. Hopefully I don't bore you in the next 20 minutes that we're talking about this kind of stuff. Um, I started off my career uh, manufacturing in Dubai about 20 years ago, uh, making apparel, and I learned how to operate factories. Um, I kind of swore I would be done with that phase of my life, and I went back to college, and I wanted to be an investment banker. Um, I moved to New York, and 9-11 happened, and everyone was losing their job. So I was like, what am I going to do? but I knew how to make clothes. So I started making clothes uh, 17 years ago. And uh, from then, I'm, we've set up supply chains on six of the seven continents um, and make for a lot of European, Asian, and uh, US brands. Um, and it's been a really fun time. In doing that, I really have become a nerd on supply chains and what the future of supply chains look like and how technology and software packages can help designers um, be better at what they do, and also supply chain executives. Um, I've worked with hundreds of designers over the 17 years, and I, I always ask this question to designers when I, I meet them. Do you have a crystal ball? And they look at me like, I have three heads. And they're like, no. I'm like, can you predict the future? And they're like, no. And I'm like, why are you designing product that's 12 to nine months before it hits the floor? And they're like, well, that's the way it's always been. And that's not, it is the way that it's always been. We, we're in a kind of an antiquated industry. But as a role of a supply chain executive and people that think about this, my job is to say, how do we make product that you can design and nine days later, it's for sale? To me, that solves a lot of the problems of inventory, of predicting the future. We remove all those variables. And that's really what my goal, that's what I'm passionate about. And that's what I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about today. So, I thought this big ball of yarn would be a good way to start. <laughs> it's kind of crazy. So, as we just kind of touched upon, the traditional business model has really been that, you know, we're looking at something, um, for example, you go to the Paris Fashion Show and you're seeing designs and things that are happening and these designers go back and they start working on new designs and, you know, you're working on stuff 12 months before it's actually going to go into production or six months before it goes into production. We produce for six months. It gets to the store and that's there. But you know, you're, you're taking a guess as to what that's going to be, what the color is going to be, what the fit's going to be, what the silhouette's going to be. I don't think that's a good model. Um, that old model's breaking down. We're seeing that in Zara. We're seeing that in Inditex. We're seeing it at H&M. Um, fast fashion is leading this, this cause. Speed to market is something that's going to be critical as we move forward. Transparency in the supply chain. People want to know what's going on in the supply chain. There's going to be a world in the near future where you're going to get a garment that you buy 
you're going to be able to go online and see everything, every worker that touched it and their stories about what that worker's life's like, where it was made, what their family's like, what they like to do. That's how this world's becoming interconnected. There's also a world of uh, customization. You know, in today's world, we don't want to be one of 10,000. We're each unique individuals. Our clothes should also be unique as well. Brand ownership. I think Katie's going to talk about this more, but, you know, just being you in a relationship with a brand is way different in the future than what it has been in the past. There's going to be a circular economy. When we make things, we want to know how it's going to be upcycled when you're done with a garment. Where does it go? Can it be recycled? Can it be repurposed into another garment? And we're going to talk about this digitization. How does digitization work? And how is that going to be the next paradigm shift in our business? So, I mean, as you can see, there's a lot of vol volatility, uncertainty, and shifts in the global economy. We're seeing that even 24 hours ago. There's potentially tariffs on Mexico. If you're making goods in Mexico, you might be paying 15, 20%, I don't know. But China, exact same thing. I mean, there's up to 25% tariffs are going on. So this is a global shifting uh, marketplace. Brick and mortar stores that we all grew up going to, that's changing. Things are moving to online, direct to consumer. We're selling through Instagram. We're selling through all these different platforms. That's a direct relationship between you and the brand. In order to take care of some of these things, we have to create supply chains that can react to the same things that are happening in the marketplace. If you use a supply chain that has a 12-month cycle on it and you're selling on Instagram, are you going to buy something that you're going to get 12 months later on Instagram? No. You want something on Instagram? You want to buy it? You want to have it shipped the next day? You want to get the third day? And as we all know, there's a decreasing footfall in brick and mortar. We're all shopping online. I mean, in my house, I think I have like 50 boxes of uh, Zappos shoes from my wife, like on any given month, and half of them get returned, but you know. So this is really interesting, um, and it kind of goes right back to rightfully so. McKenzie did a study, and they said 60% of apparel executives procure they want their sourcing to be near shore. What's near shore? Near shore is making it rightfully sown. If you're designing here and you can make something at rightfully sown, that's about as close as you're going to get to your manufacturing base. In my world, as close as we get is Guatemala. So we make things in Guatemala. We can ship it there. I can produce in Guatemala. I can ship it at noon. And it can be delivered in Kansas City at 7.30 that night. So that's just the tip of the iceberg. When we go back and look at that deeper, what's a nearshoring operation look like? I can design a product on a Monday. It can be in production on Monday night. It can be in stitching on Tuesday. It can be in QC on Wednesday. It can ship on Thursday, and on Friday it's delivered. We've taken a 12-month cycle, and we've can just make, broken it down to five days. That is what's interesting to me. You can see that global apparel sourcing executives, the trend is going to be more towards nearshoring. We don't want things made in Bangladesh that takes 40 days to ship on the water. It's ridiculous. This brings me to personalization. We are all individuals, and in today's world, we see that we want to be individual. So how do we, as brands, you know, in the old way of looking at it, like, if you went to Gap, you know, they might produce 500,000 in one style. Are you like 500,000 other people? No, you're your own individual person. Our apparel needs to catch up with the times of like what it is. Like we have iPhones. I, I, I'm not a fan of Galaxy. Um, but we personalize our screen. We personalize our watch bands. Why don't we personalize our apparel? And like that's to me like how do we do this? Levi's did a great like little prototype. And what they did was they made jeans. And they made this machine. We're going to talk about Sobots in a second. But the machine basically takes a pair of denim jeans. You get to go in there and you get to program where the whiskers are, how it's cut, I mean, what the fade looks like, what the designs are on it. You get to do it right there. It spits out your jeans 30 seconds later. So you got to custom make your design, jeans and the designs that you want in it. To me, that's fascinating because it allows for individual nature of garments. 
talking a little about SOBOTs, everyone likes to talk about SOBOTs. They're not quite there in the future yet, but they're moving towards automa automation. And in our factories, we're starting to use more and more automation. And this is kind of a in-depth like kind of look at it, but it shows that the importance of short lead time and the importance of automation. And you can see if you move to the high side and the high side, basics with prints are something that really is going to be moved to automation and to a shorter lead time. And things that are like high volume basics, they don't need to have a short lead time. You can make that in Bangladesh because it's a white tea. If you don't sell the white tea tomorrow, you'll sell it the day after that. And if you don't sell it the day after that, you'll sell it next month. It's a commodity. But like when we're talking about high fashion pieces, you need to be on the cusp of what's happening. This kind of moves into what a lot of brands would think about, but to me it's also important about supply chains because as a supply chain guy, I have to know what the brand, I have to anticipate what the brand needs in order to build supply chains back for them. So what's that look like? We know that like in this survey, consumer ships are moving towards mobile obsessed, platforms first, getting personal, these are things that we have to create in our supply chain so that you as designers have the ability to use your creative nature and we can make that for you. And if there's places where we can push the envelope of what is possible, the innovation that comes from you is amazing. Like, right, you'll figure out a better way to use some of these things. This is an interesting study too. So McKinsey went back in 2018, they looked at executives in the, in the apparel sourcing world and they said, you know, what are the issues that you see? And 2016, you can see it, 2017. I'm interested in 2018. Changing digital fast. That's supply chain based. In order to be fast, we're gonna have to be digital. We're gonna have to reinvent the way that we're thinking about things. <laughs> Again, it's more than just product. I mean, you can read it for yourself, but consumers are more seriously concerned with social and environmental causes that many regard as the defining issues of our time. They're increasingly backed by their beliefs that shopping habits are favoring brands that are aligned with their values and avoiding those that don't. I think this is a true statement. When we look at this in the world and how social media has broken down, we all have micro brands. Each influencer is his own micro brand. We have to start thinking like this. This goes back to, the, again, social media influencing. If we look at the legacy brands that are there and we look at challenger brands, if you go look at Prada, Ralph, Laura, Ralph Lauren, Zara, these are old school ways of thinking. Are they still great brands? Absolutely. But when you look at like these new brands that are coming up, how are they using social media to get it out? How are they engaging? How are they getting feedback? I'm gonna talk about this in one second. This is a brand that I've done a lot of work with this is a brand based out of Asia. They're making awesome stuff. It's for an Asian market, but it's totally applicable to this market. So this is kind of what I think is a very futuristic way of looking at things. Speed, three days. From the time that you order, everything is produced within three days. 35 days from when the designer starts their design to it's conceptualized, until it's prototyped, until it's manufactured, until it's delivered, 35 days. When we talk about the engagement, they're doing 12 seasons a year. That's kind of mind blowing in and of itself, that's 12 seasons a year, but I'm gonna take it one step further. You see where it says 36 chapters, on the first week of every month, they launch a new micro collection. On the second week of the month, a second micro collection. On the third week of the month, a third micro collection, and on the fourth week of the month, it's a combination of the best sellers of those three weeks. You move to the next month, it's a whole new design collection. These guys are really smart, and the way that we've created it is they're taking designs, they're putting them out there on social media, they're getting feedback, and based on what is trending and what's getting likes and what's getting comments, they design further in that direction. They take out the laggards that aren't performing, they remove them. So basically, this is a, a social media design brand because you, by liking and clicking and comments, are actually help designing what the future is. The question becomes, how is this possible?
and technology doesn't always work. I need to click one slide more. Got it. Okay, so we use a lot of different software platforms. This one's an LA-based platform called Tuca Tech. Tuca Tech is like mind-blowingly amazing. Okay, I can take you, I can get an avatar of you, I can take your measurements, I can put them into an avatar, then I have a virtual representation of who you are. I can take a design, I can drape it over you, and it starts to make the pattern of what I need. Once I have that, I can program the avatar to do whatever I want. We're making performance apparel, I'm gonna tell them, let's do squats, let's do jumping jacks, I wanna see what happens when you run. It puts it all into motion, it shows me all the stress points on the garment of where it's hitting, where it's not hitting, where it's loose, where I need to change the pattern. We make those adjustments on the pattern, we go back and we run it again. That gets us a pattern. What we used to be able to do this was bring in a fit model, the fit model comes in, they're only available certain days. We try it on, we make adjustments, it's all by hand, we change a paper pattern, and we go back and do it again. Antiquated, we're at 12 months again. We need to be at three days. This is a great example. This is another program that we use, okay? We're gonna start off with a t-shirt, and I'm gonna show you how we make garments in the future. I'm taking a t-shirt. I got you as an avatar. I'm designing it in real time. It's a little bit high speed right now, but this is all software that's available right now. I'm just gonna let this run, it's about 20 seconds, and you're gonna see the end product. While this is happening, I program in what the elasticity of the fabric is, what the fabric is, what the weight is, what the content is. My avatar's, my avatar's made to the specs that are there. I wanna add a pocket. I wanna see what the hood looks like. I'm not really liking this design. Let's add a zipper. The beauty of what's happening right here is that in addition to this being designed, it's also creating the pattern. On the right side is the pattern that allows me to go into production. You could use this program and be sitting at the pa Paris Fashion Show with your laptop and a Wi-Fi connection and be inspired by what you're seeing. And when you're inspired by what you're seeing, you can be designing. You know what, I wanna add a zipper to this. What's it gonna look like to a zipper? So we're gonna add a zipper here in about, there you go. The pattern changes, it's ready. I wanna see how the hood is gonna drape back over someone's head. So we're gonna pull it back. Do we want the hood to be bigger? Do we want it to be smaller? Whatever it is, we can change it right here in real time. This is the future of designing. We marry this program with another program called Clo. So again, we have an avatar that's your specs. And now, what I've done is, you can see up here, I've taken the pattern that I've created, I drape it onto another avatar, and then, this is where creative comes in, right? We have tech design, and then we have graphics. Graphics are just designing in general. With this avatar, I can go back and change what I want, what the fabrics I want, what the colors I want. Anything you wanna change on this, it becomes real. And then from here, we have production-ready files. So once I'm done with this program, literally, I drop it, boom. I put it into my system. I can start producing this within five minutes later. Oops. Micro factories. Micro factories are the future. We don't need to be making 500,000 of one thing anymore. And that's beautiful because you know why? We, there's an opportunity for anyone to create their own brand. There's an opportunity to make small collections. It's like what rightfully so said, small batches between 40 and 200. My personal belief is a small batch can be one. Why not? It's possible. But when we have some small factories like this, we have line production and we have modular production. There's two different types of manufacturing, but if you set up the right way, both of them, you can get extremely efficient output by using both modular and line. Line production is when we have a line of people making it. That's the antiquated way of working. Modular production is when we have small groups that are making individual pieces of the, uh, the garment that get stitched together at the end. And I think that's, uh, again, the future of what we're doing. So this is an example of a small 
micro factory. I, we set this one up. You can see the stitching rooms, cutting rooms, digital um, patterns, and everything like that all going through. Um, and we're doing that all the time. And yeah, that kind of wraps up where I'm at. And I hopefully I blew your mind on how we design things in the future. Yeah, go ahead. Please go right in if you would. That would be helpful. And if anyone else has questions too, just head on over to the aisles to the microphones. But go right ahead. Okay. You're, you're fine. How much is the how much is the technology cost to attack and close? Okay. Yeah. So, um, to be honest with you, the programs are super expensive. Like, um, the best way would be to go to someone like Tukatech, and they actually have centers where you can go and work on you know different things for them and use some of their softwares without buying it outright. Like, really, these software packages are set up for people like me that are like, you know, doing thousands of styles. And, you know, and go and do it. But there are ways to do it if you get online and look at it. And I think there's some trial versions of it and stuff that you can use as well. But you can also talk to them and they have centers where you can go in and, and they'll make patterns for you in this system. Rightfully so, and has a, a beautiful micro factory here. Um, yeah, so I, I would tell them what I do is everything is international. No, please. Wonderful. Those are great questions. Yeah, so great, questions. Really great questions. Are there other questions from the audience? By show of hands or appearance at the mic, we have a question right here. I'm curious. I uh, really appreciate that designers would get to see their uh, designs turned around so quickly, but it feels like it's also um, supporting the negative sides of fast fashion, too, as far as like this disposability of how quickly you can bring things to the market. What are you doing to make sure that the factories that are turning things around so quickly are ethically treating their employees, are using materials that are sustainable? Like what is your organization like trying to do to see through each of those? Well, I mean, so there's a, a few different questions there. Like I don't believe that fast fashion in and of itself is negative. Like I actually think it's like a way of bringing things to market quicker. Um, in terms of like ethically treating workers, it, it's a must. I mean, there's just a, there's no way around it. I mean, I, I think that every factory is a person and you have to understand the characteristics of a person and if they're good or bad or whatever it is. In the world that I live in, we have to treat people ethically. We, you know, we have to like go back and look at that because in today's world of social media, anything could happen, you know, someone can, I mean, you see in Vietnam that there are people or Cambodia that their workers are protesting and it shows up in the news here. Mm -hmm. Like no one can afford to do that. I mean, I think that's, something that hopefully is phasing out. I truly do hope it's phasing out because we don't want to be in any in situation like that. We go back and so socially audit factories to you make go sure. To them, like you get to go and see the conditions and design them. Oh, a hundred percent. And outside of that, there's also people that go in and audit them and, and go through all the labor and see what it is. When you talk about sustainability of, of garments, I, you know, honestly, it's an interesting thing. We've talked about this for years and years and years. Um, a lot of that comes from the design and what people want too, right? You know, I mean, it's really nice to talk about, yes, we're gonna use organic cotton, or I'm a personal fan of BCI cotton, which is the Better, Co Better Cotton Initiative. Um, and you know, our pets and things like that, love to use it. I personally am an environmentalist. I do that every single time. That also comes from the people that are designing, saying that we want this in our garment, we're gonna promote this to our end consumer, and our end consumer is gonna pay for this. So it's, it's hard to say to a factory, use eco-friendly fabric yeah. if the, it's not going to get sold because that's a, that, that is not a win-win situation. Where it is a win-win situation is we can go into factories and set them up so that there's water treatment plants. How are they disposing waste? How are they using scraps and different things like that? How do we get marker efficiency? Like we talk about that, that's a huge thing, right? Tukatech is really one of the best things about them is that 
they're able to get a pattern and get marker efficiencies that are unlike anybody else. That's reducing waste in the supply chain. Okay. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Thank you. Good. Great. I believe we have time for maybe one or two more questions. Go right ahead. Uh, where is the best training for this, and do you have intern programs at your company? Uh, the best training for this is uh, trial and error after 17 years. Um, no, I, I think probably a good training probably would be, you know, Jennifer, she's a wealth of knowledge um, to learn about these supply chains and things like that. I mean, she's really on point, and Pamela, um, also there, she knows all about markers and things like that. Um, I don't know if there's a really like a school of training for this. I mean, I was in Asia four times a year for 15 years, in Central America like six times a year for 14, 15 years, and just being on the ground, um, understanding supply chains for my life. So I, I don't know if there's a specific training program. Yeah. Hey, Daniela. Happy birthday, Daniela. <laughs> you have a good birthday. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, so like one of the things that we worked on about five, six years ago and we've started to implement is how do you, when we make a pattern, we have cutting waste. And what is that cutting waste? Where does it go? And we actually f figured out a way to take the cutting waste and put it into an industrial shredder, shred that down back to a fiber, and then mix it back in with virgin cotton and polyester and respin a new yarn that out, is out of that. So actually, we can take the cuttings of 70 t-shirts and make one new t-shirt out of it by using those cuttings. Um, there are some companies that are doing that. It's a little bit problematic to get really technical. You're shredding the fiber down to a shorter staple, which doesn't make it feel quite as nice. Um, but there's other ways to use the, the waste as well. Um, a lot of times what they're doing is we're taking cutting waste and we're selling it in the local market and they're using it in third world countries to make mops and different things out of it so that fabric gets reused again and again and again. In addition to that, I think futuristic, that's kind of an antiquated way of looking at it, but futuristic looking in the future is, you know, there's companies like Patagonia that has a recycling program for their garments, right, where you can actually give your garments back and get a discount. I, I think one of the interesting models that I've seen recently is a, a trade-in program, right? So you can actually trade your garment in, it gets sold on an online marketplace to someone that doesn't want a new garment but wants that same quality, and you get a credit towards your new garment so that garment keeps getting recycled through, upcycled back into the system. Um, because hopefully when we make product, it lasts more than, you know, two or three seasons. And I think to the point that uh, the woman made here, how do we make fast fashion has a, a negative connotation at times of being a throwaway garment where you're going to wear it for one season and throw it away. I, I, I completely agree with that. That's a, a very bad way of looking at it. We should make garments that last much longer than that. So there's a question over here. Please stand. Yeah. Um, you have to be trained on that system. I mean, it's not like a plug and play, like to understand how to move that around. It would be the equivalent of taking a child and giving them AI and say, design something in AI. And they'll have no idea how to do it. So, I mean, I gave you a, just a 30 second video of how it's done, but the training that went in behind that in order to make that feasible, super in depth. So in terms of, does that take away someone's job? No, I would actually disagree with that. I actually think it makes that person's job way more efficient, and they can do way more designs by using a program like that. But you do have to be trained on it. So Joshua, I wanted to ask you yeah. a question on, I, I hope on behalf of the audience. Can I see by a show of hands, how many of you are fashion designers? Fashion designers. Multiple, multiple people in the room. How many of you are in another aspect of the fashion industry, maybe as an apparel manufacturer, so is that sort of thing? Okay, great. And would most of you say that you are Kansas City based? Okay, so here's the question. If you're living and working in Kansas City and you have a fashion brand or a fashion idea and you really want to get to market and you feel a little bit disconnected because we feel like sometimes we're in the Midwest and we don't get to 
or we're not in the best possible place, we're not in one of the epicenters. And of course, that's part of the work of Rightfully So, bringing about this renaissance. What is the number one thing to do if you're starting out, or if you have gone so far but you've stagnated, how do you get moving again to push out to market? Um, that's an interesting question. It's difficult, to be honest with you. I think one of the beauties of today's world is that we're all interconnected. We can get on the internet and we can find factories and you know, people offering services all the way around the world. Uh, to me, I think, and, and Katie might speak to this more, it, how do you uh, validate your product to ensure that it's something that you really want to move forward with? I think once you have that validation, then you have the confidence to go to a manufacturer and say, look, I want to make this. And how do we make this work? It's got to be a, a mutually beneficial relationship, right? Like, I get pitched ideas all the time, and I'm just like, oh my God, this is the worst idea ever. <laughs> you know, I'm like, do you actually tell them that? Do you let them know so they can <laughs> stop and find something new to do <laughs> or I, a new approach? I, no, no, I'm very polite. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so but here's a really a good question yeah. then. And we got just a short time left, yeah. but I want to ask how do you know, how do you get that validation, that proof of concept that what you're doing? is the right thing to do? And how much should you invest in making that happen? Because that's a, a, a big part of it too. I, I think, you know, honestly, in today's world wh where we used to have to go back and have a showroom and show things and buyers would come in and right. you'd be at the whim of a buyer at Nordstrom's that decides if your product's good or bad or not, I think that's, that's gone. You know, I, I think if, you know, if Haley at City Gym wants to make a line of clothes, she can be like, here's my concept of what I want to do. And she can put it on Instagram and be like, do you guys like this? And just by the feedback she's getting on that, she can determine whether it's a product to move forward with or not. That's what we're doing in this company, Lulu, sir. We're designing things, and we might design 20 things, and out of that, we might take three. So that's the answer to your question. We're validating it through social media. And if you have that validation of social media, then you have the confidence to go to a manufacturer and say, yes. It's gotta be, you've got to come to me, though with confidence of like, I can make this work and this is how I'm gonna make it work and then I have the confidence to go make for you. Excellent answer. So I would say to anyone who's trying, yes, let's give a big round of applause to Josh. Thanks.